刘洋老师的要求，写一下学校姓、学校和姓名。谢谢大家。嗯，稍等一会儿，那个，因为那个 Learning Pen 那边早上是八点钟啊，嗯，那个我们现在正还在联系他。嗨，大家好，嗯嗯，艾瑞克教授，可能啊，我们现在时间已经到了 ，OK， 我先用英文开始吧 ，OK， 呃、uh, ，Hello everybody， 嗯嗯 ，This is a summer short school， 呃、uh, ，control machine learning and numericals， 也就是呃 ，supported by the Tianyuan Mathematical Center in Northeast China， 呃、uh, ，This course is opened by Professor Eric Zhuang，OK，、okay, from the FAU， 呃、uh, ，Professor Eric。Now is the chair of dynamics, control, and numerical. Uh, he's Alexander von Hammer professor. Uh, he's an expert, uh, not, a, not only an expert, he's a superstar in uh, applying math, mathematics, uh, such as uh, PDE, system control, numerical analysis, and uh, machine learning. Okay. Uh, now, you find professor. Yes. Can you hear me? Hello. Hello. Yes. Professor, are you online? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. Can you, can you hear me, Professor? Yeah, I do. I do. You? Do you okay. hear me? Uh, uh, thank you. I hear you okay. very well. Thank you. Thank okay. you. It's working very well. Okay, uh, now it's your time. Enjoy your time, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so thank you, Professor Kai uh, Sang, for this very gentle invitation. It's for me a great pleasure to, to be here with you during this uh, summertime. I hope you are all doing well. And I also hope that out of this uh, lecture series, you will get uh, some... Uh, some hints of what the field has been doing until now and what are the possible perspectives. And I hope this will be, you know, an encouraging course for you to, to work on this area. Let me, uh, let me start with a, um, a general introduction. Maybe I should share the slides first, otherwise you will see nothing, sorry. Just a second. Okay. Okay. You see the slides now, right? You see them now. So let me let me start with a general introduction uh, from a say historical perspective, uh, also referring to some important applications that have influenced uh, very much the field of control systems that as you will see is very much related to the broad area of data science and 
machine learning. So, um, in fact, oftentimes when we teach mathematics, right, you we start from the very recent developments, we give very rigorous definitions, and then out of this concept, we develop the main theorems and proofs, and then eventually, in the end, we give some examples of potential applications. But actually, science often has been developed in a different direction, right? It has been when, when dealing with concrete applications that people have cued some specific solutions, models, ideas, theorems, results, computational methods. And this eventually, in the end, after many years of uh, maturation, has led to, you know, some well-defined fields, right? So this is the perspective I would like to take here, rather than giving you a, a rigorous traditional course in which we start from the very last definition, right? And try to present the most technical work, I will try to motivate the course so that you realize that in fact, control theory, some people call it control engineering, some other people call it uh, mathematical control, Actually, control is a broad multidisciplinary field uh, made out of contributions from different areas, right? So engineering, mathematics, computer sciences are probably the, the key three fields that have contributed to this. But oftentimes, is it true also that the, you know, that the contributions to control have been discovered, have been developed when dealing with applications also in other areas like uh, biological systems, uh, astronautics, uh, quantum chemistry, and so on. Okay, so let's then uh, devote this uh, first session of today to making this uh, panoramic presentation. Of course, the presentation is not exhaustive at all, right? So we could be lecturing a whole semester about, you know, the history of control systems, the, the links to different disciplines in science, the role it has developed, you know, played not only within sciences, but also on technological applications in the industrial revolution, in the, say, data-driven revolution that we are experiencing now. It will be a very, very uh, passionate and long subject, but I think it's worth to devote this uh, first session to it before we get into more, say, uh, mathematical contents. So before I do that, let me introduce myself. So my name is Enrique Suazua. I am the chair professor in, uh, in uh, Erlangen University, in Frederick Alexander University in uh, Erlangen, uh, close to Nuremberg in Bayern, Baviera, Bavaria, in uh, Germany. Um, I'm also a part-time professor in Autonoma de Madrid and Deusto in Bilbao. I am actually now in, in Madrid, in my home university, Universidad Autonoma de Madrid. And then two years ago, we were funded by the Alexander von Humboldt Professorship to run a chair in, uh, in Germany, in FAO, in Friedrichs Alexander Universitat. Uh, and this is where I am running most of my activity. Uh, you have here the web page of the of the chair where you will you know find uh, plenty of contents uh, of the work we are doing and uh, as you will see uh, we are somehow driven by the two main forces right on one side we try to develop mathematics uh, computational mathematics methods we are mathematicians and this is what we like doing but it's always good to get inspired on some concrete applications like uh, material sciences, traffic, biological models, multi-agent systems, right? Um, partial differential equations, inverse problems. So we try to cover a multifold agenda in which we can integrate, uh, especially young people, either for you know master thesis, for PhD thesis, or for postdoctoral training. Right, so we try to integrate people with different, say, diverse interests, so that you know they can meet together, they can work together, and in this way generate some uh, kind of, uh, um, say, dynamics of cross fertilization. 
Okay, so this being said, you will find a lot of contents on in the web page of uh, our chair. I will show you maybe during the course of our web pages as well. Let me let me begin by by telling you something about control. So, uh, in in fact, it will be endless, right, to indicate how many important applications to technology, to engineering, to economics, to society control theory has, right? But just to give you a quick idea, right? I, uh, this slide uh, has been composed by my friend, Emmanuel Trella in Paris. Uh, there is, of course, a lot of applications to mechanics, right? So mechanics, you see here, aeronautics, you see astronautics, uh, you see, you know, the classical penduli, right? Uh, you see motion, this could be, you know, uh, automobile, a car, right? There are more and more applications, of course, also to biology, right? Where biology, as you know, biology, medicine, biomedicine, biomedicine, modern techniques in medicine are meeting robotics. So to make things, you know, operations to be sometimes uh, uh, realized by machines, by driven by expert humans that oftentimes are not even on site so that they can guide, you know, remote uh, operations. Of course, uh, electronics, electricity, energy, networks, gas networks, uh, water networks, uh, irrigation, um, chemistry, of course, chemical processes, Every, every chemical product in order to be well designed needs to follow a very specific dynamics that needs to be tuned, regulated, controlled during the whole, say, time horizon. And, and of course, economics, right? So we know also how important economics is. You can work very hard. I mean, if the economy of your country is not stable, all these efforts risk to, to dissipate a lot. So these are just a few mechanics biomedicine, electricity, energy, economics, chemistry, just some examples of very important fields in our lives in which as soon as you will start, uh, you know, checking how the, the most relevant processes are working, you will find plenty of elements of control theory, control systems, dynamical systems under control, right? Optimization processes, and precisely the lectures we are delivering these days will be devoted to present some of the mathematical techniques that can be employed in order to tackle these issues, right? Now, in my previous slide, I have indicated uh, some uh, quite recent applications, right? Contemporary applications, but actually the field of uh, control theory uh, goes back to the very early you know, civilization, right? So it was already uh, Aristotle, right? In his uh, traditional book, uh, Politics, who said something like this. He said, if every instrument could accomplish its own work, obeying or anticipating the will of others, if the shovel waved and pick touched the lyre without a hand to guide them, chief warmen will not need servant nor master's slave. So it was already 2,500 years ago that Aristoteles, out of his mind, just by through uh, philosophical uh, reflection, that he realized that in order to make the humans free, right? So to be, you know, so that they will be allowed to be dedicated what they really like to do, playing music, doing a sport, uh, doing mathematics, whatever you like to do, cooking, walking, talking to your friends. In order to make humans free, humans should be able to develop machines that will obey the will of humans and realize the task that in this way, the humans will not need to do, and in this manner, be able, be free to handle their own work, right? So maybe it is summertime, it's probably hot in, 
you know, in many of the of the cities in China, I used to go every summer to Sichuan University in Chengdu, where I visit my colleague and friend, Professor Xu Sang and his team together with uh, Chi Liu. But I also have visited other universities in, uh, in China, like uh, Changchun, like uh, Tianjin, uh, Beijing, Fudan. Uh, normally in this summertime is hot. And it's very pleasant when you get to the hotel or you go to your office to have air conditioning, right? And then the air conditioning is regulated in an automatic manner. It's regulated through a thermostat. So you can choose the temperature in your room, say 19 degrees or 21 degrees, and you let it work. And it's the, this engine that automatically is doing the job. When the temperature is getting too high, you know, the engine will turn on and will start injecting cooler in order to diminish the temperature. But as soon as the temperature is getting too cold, below the level you have chosen, the target of say 21 degrees, then the engine will stop, right? So that, you know, the temperature doesn't keep decreasing. So in a kind of bam bang switching uh, oscillatory pattern, the machine regulates temperature automatically. This is a very good example of what Aristoteles has in mind. In this way, you can focus on delivering your talk or listening to the talk, and you don't need to be concerned about air conditioning. Otherwise, every say five minutes or so, you should be, you know, dealing with the, you know, with the device and turn it on and off just to, you know, manually uh, regulate the temperature according to your wish. Okay. So the thermostat, you know, heating systems, refrigeration systems are probably one of the most obvious uh, application of control theory that we are using nowadays all the time and we don't even realize it, okay? And this is one of the strengths of control theory. Control theory is everywhere, but oftentimes you don't even realize it. It works and because it works, you don't pay attention to it. If it will break, then you will be concerned, right? So if the air conditioning a thermostat doesn't work anymore, then you will be concerned and you will have to, to call the technician to fix it, right? Because you don't want the, the, the device to be working permanently or not to be sensitive enough. So to realize that it has to be, you know, on, on the old mode when the temperature is too high, okay? So you see the origins go back to Aristoteles, basically 200, 2,500 years back. And probably if we will check in other civilizations in, in the ancient China and all other human civilizations, you will discover that from the very early, you know, when, when the societies started to develop, humans started to interact, they started to organize their daily life into societies, they were already cuning the fundamentals, the foundations of what is called today control theory. So there are many, many interesting books and uh, about, you know, the history of the control theory, the state of the art, the different applications. Uh, there is, uh, in particular, this uh, uh, interesting, uh, say, report by the American Society, SIAM. SIAM is the Society for Industrial and Applied Mathematics. This was edited back in 2003, and you can download uh, this uh, booklet, the PDF, out of the web page of Siam for free. Uh, the name of that report, this was a cooperative work in which several experts were contributing with uh, short articles. It was called uh, Control in an Information-Rich World, right? And of course, uh, yeah, so we are now in the world of globalization, we are in the world of communications, we are in the world of uh, uh, social networks, in the world of internet, of Zoom, of WeChat, of uh, you know emails, uh, and uh, in in that new world, in some sense, of course, because of the new paradigms of say human uh, interaction, communication, and technologies, new phenomena are emerging, right? And therefore, the mathematical 
say, areas, in particular control theory, has been very applied and very, therefore, sensitive to the evolution of uh, contemporary uh, trends and, and necessities uh, needed to adapt, right? And this was precisely the point that the book was making, right? At that time, they were reporting on more than 100 years of development of the discipline, right? But on the other hand, they said, well, the world is changing and we need new mathematics in order to face the new challenges. So this is the front page of the book. And um, this is a front page I, I like very much. So you see the different uh, devices that traditionally have appeared in control theory. So here you see the ball regulation engine, right, of the uh, steam engine that played a fundamental role in industrial regulation, right? So this uh, ball regulation mechanism is the one that allows you to keep, you know, pressure within the, you know, the steam engine to be constant so that the performance of the train in motion is uh, more or less uniform, but it can be also, you know, uh, employed in order to guarantee constant velocity on, for instance, rotating, rotating uh, devices like uh, the classical CD players, right? So you know that you really don't want to listen to your CD, the music, uh, in, a, in a situation in which the, the velocity is oscillatory. This will make a non-harmonious right, sound, right? If you want it to be, you know, to play nicely, you need also to guarantee a constant velocity. And this is what the, the ball right, uh, regulation mechanism does, right? Uh, it enjoys of, you know, the rotational, say, velocity of, say, the, the device under consideration in order to regulate it and keep it constant during the whole time horizon. This is a microchip that you can see in your portable computer or uh, telephone. Uh, this is a, a very basic uh, classical robot, probably, you know, meant in order to transport goods or to supervise uh, some areas with uh, its camera. This is the traditional thermostat. Now you don't even see them very often. This, this device now looks like a bit old fashioned, maybe, you know, uh, coming from the 50s or the 60s. Now the, the thermostat is built in and often you don't simply you just regulate the temperature with your you know remote control and you don't need to to deal with such a you know a big uh, external device but the role as i said before is to keep temperature uh, constant in a heating or refrigeration system uh, this is the first uh, airplane of the Wright brothers those that uh, you know are at the origin of uh, aviation of aeronautics uh, this is a cancer cell, just to represent the complex uh, dynamics of, uh, say, human uh, diseases. Uh, this is a telecommunication network here. Okay, so this could be also a network for, you know, it can be telephone, it can be internet, it can be irrigation, it can be uh, logistics, it can be the transportation of goods, just a network. Uh, this is also a, a network, but uh, probably in a conflict configuration where, you know, different airplanes are, are supervising or fighting. And this is a, a modern uh, combat airplane, right? So this, these are just some figures in order to represent how broad the applications of control theory are, okay? Let me give you one example. And in this example, you already see uh, the two say, uh, classical paradigms of control. One is uh, active control, right? And the other one is passive control, right? So what is the difference between uh, passive and active? Okay, so uh, the good example I, you know, the example I wanted to share with you is this of noise reduction, okay? So, well, what is noise reduction? We all know. I'm sitting in my office here in Madrid. I'm talking to you and I want, you know, the environment, the, my bureau 
to be silent, right? So that you can hear me well and I can also hear your comments. So we are living here in this cloud. This is where our office is. But, you know, we are not completely satisfied, right? Sorry. We are not completely satisfied because we feel that there is some noise, right? So maybe cars are coming outside or maybe the train or maybe there is people walking around in the corridors and in the street and this is being noisy, right? So there is no noise inside. So how does an active control mechanism uh, behave? Well, we have, first of all, first of all, we have a sensor that is able to capture, you know, the noise within the room. But on the other hand, we should have another sensor, which is also capturing the noise that is coming from the outside, right? So basically, then you will have two sensors. One is how much noise is incoming, right? In some sense, I need to anticipate, right? the effect of this incoming noise to the diminishing of my comfort in the room. So there is a sensor capturing the incoming noise. And then there is another sensor that is capturing the noise inside. Okay, so now with the measure I'm doing now of the noise I have now, right? I will uh, put this into the mathematical algorithm, right? That will then decide what is the anti-noise I like to implement? So there is plus, then I will inject minus. This is like the heating system, right? So there is plus, there is heat, then I inject minus, cool air, in order to regulate temperature and keep it going down. And in case inside there is minus, because it's cold, then I will inject hot air plus, so to compensate each other, and keep always the temperature on the given, say, on the chosen threshold, so plus, minus, zero, okay? So this is what we do here. So we, we measure the noise inside. Out of this, we decide how much anti-noise we are implementing, right? But you see, even if I do it now, there will be a still, you know, noise coming from the outside, right? And therefore, I will need to keep this process ongoing again and again and again in an endless manner. And this is what is called the feedback control, right? So feedback control refers to the fact that uh, you don't just apply the control once and let the system evolve, but you have to be refreshing the action you are uh, uh, realizing on the system again and again and again in order to keep the evolution of the dynamics on the regime you like, okay? This is the first uh, concept, active control. Well, some other people say, well, but this is too complicated. I don't have sensors, for instance. If you don't have the sensors, there is nothing you can do. If you cannot measure the, the noise inside every, say, second or every 20 seconds, if you don't have these measures, you cannot act, right? You don't have information to design your action if you are not able to, you know, to monitor, you know, the evolution of the noise inside. So maybe you don't have the sensor. Maybe you don't have the actuator. Maybe you don't have a, a mean of injecting minus in order to compensate the plus, right? So you can be missing either the sensors. You can be missing maybe the, the actuation. You don't have access to, you know, to the device. There is nothing you can do because you cannot get in to, you know, to interfere the dynamics, right? Or, or maybe you simply lack the mathematics. I mean, you don't know control theory, you don't know control systems, and therefore there is nothing you can do. I mean, you cannot, right, out of the information and the actuation regulate through a mathematical algorithm. So then this is, this is complicated. Maybe you prefer to do it in a, a passive mode. What does it mean to do it in a passive mode? Well, it means simply that the design of the engine, right, or the device, in this case of the building in which your office is placed, will be done once forever in an intelligent manner so that when you are in, you know, you can be, say, comfortable 
because simply, you know, the, all the walls, all the devices in the room have been designed in order to minimize uh, noise propagation and absorption. And this is what is represented in, in, this, in this picture. So this is, you know, you are on travel and then you go to a hotel, you know, our university residency where you are spending the night. So you are here, you are trying to sleep here. And then, you know, in the upper floor, your neighbor decides to play, you know, with a, with a ball, with a ping pong ball, with a billiard ball, right? Then, of course, uh, I mean, the risk is that whenever this, uh, this ball is, you know, is colliding with the floor, this will generate an acoustic, uh, say, signal, an acoustic shock that will penetrate into your floor, you know, the down floor, at least partially, making your rest or your concentration on your study simply impossible because it's too noisy. There are uh, two possibilities for designing this interface. So this interface, of course, there are a few centimeters of, you know, the, the roof, right? But but you can, you know, when you cover the upper floor, uh, the layer of material you can choose to cover it up can be of two very different natures. It can be a very hard material. And if the material is some kind of a stone, it's very hard, then the sound will be very acute. And the, and the you know, the stone, you know, the, the granitic material will absorb the noise and will transmit the noise. So this will be a configuration in which your room, even though maybe you paid very expensive for the room, is very noisy simply because, you know, the hotel, the architects, the designers of the hotel forgot that uh, placing a hard floor even though it might be nice, might be beautiful, elegant, or even, you know, maybe convenient for cleaning, is not the most, say, efficient way for acoustic isolation, right? So if instead of employing a hard material to cover the floor, you will use a soft material, a carpet, then whenever, say, some object falls down, you know, the keys of your car fall down and collide the floor in a noisy manner, this carpet will absorb most of this noise. And therefore, this noise, even though it has been generated, of course, in, you know, has been, you know, there was a collusion, right? The, the noise will not go through this interface and you will probably be able to continue concentrated or sleeping without being disturbed by your neighbor. So you see that here we are playing actively. We need technology. We need, say, sensors, actuators, and mathematical algorithms. Here, you basically just need, uh, say, some common sense, some intelligence for the design of the building, and then the appropriate materials, right? So this is passive control. Passive control has a lot to do with the optimal uh, design, right? That we identify more with, uh, uh, say, a priori conception of uh, the optimal device in a durable, in a stable manner for a long time interval and is very much related to geometry and materials, right? So in optimal uh, design, the geometry and the materials are extremely important, right? So when you go to a concert hall, you also look, oh, you see it's an interesting geometry. I didn't expect something, you know, quite uh, so sophisticated with uh, complicated geometrical shapes, or you look to the walls and you see, oh, but the wall is uh, layered or is perforated and the materials are quite uh, modern and, uh, you know, they are either natural wood or they are acrylic, but uh, in general, everything is quite sophisticated. So the reason for that is that uh, all this chamber in which maybe 1,000 people go to listen to the opera, has been designed in a way to guarantee an optimal propagation of the acoustic signals 
so that you can enjoy music without uh, noisy vibrations, okay? Reducing noise, okay? So as I said, passive control is very much related to optimal design, to the calculus of variations, and it's very much about the choice of the geometry and the materials you are employing is the same as when you buy a bicycle. There are bicycles very cheap, but then they are very heavy. And then there are bicycles that are beautiful, fantastic, and then they are very light. Of course, they are not made out of the same materials, right? The geometry is not the same, but probably what really makes a bigger difference is the materials that have been employed for their um, manufacturing. While active control, right, is uh, very much related to sensors, actuators, and feedback, right? Feedback has been, you know, the concept that uh, guarantees, that indicates that if you want really to make a process to behave optimally, you have to keep controlling it again and again and again, okay? So here you see a very clear example, classical example of noise reduction. I show you the picture of the same person, of the same woman. Uh, we don't know who this is. This is taken randomly from, from internet, right? But then if I ask you, what is the noisy picture? Where is more noise? Is there more noise on the left or is there more noise on the right? What do you think? Is there more noise on the left or on the right? Does anyone know? You can also write your comments on the chat if you wish. It's left. Yeah, left. It's clear, right? So we don't know who this person is, but here we see a picture in which the main features, you know, the eye, the skin, the mouth, the nose, you know, the hair is visible, right? With all these uh, noisy uh, pixels that are somehow polluting, you know, the, you know, the, the clarity of, of the picture on the right, okay? So noise reduction is a classical application of control. I have mentioned to you, you know, in this comparison, typical, say, paradigm of comparison of active versus passive control, we were discussing about uh, noise reduction. And then, of course, noise reduction is a whole field. You will find books, journals, conferences about noise reduction applied to every, every field. So now you see that how the modern cars are less and less noisy to a point that uh, they might even become a little bit dangerous for humans because we don't realize the cars are incoming and then this can be risky when you are walking or you are with your bicycle in the street, right? On the road, right? So the, the noise of the modern cars is much lower than it was few years or decades before. There is a lot of technology, a lot of uh, science of mathematics and, and control theory pulled on that. But there are some basic ideas that allow us to already deal with this in a quite efficient, efficient manner, right? So the, the idea of Gauss, you know, you know that, uh, you know, you have the Gaussian, right? The Gaussian, right? It's a Gaussian in which you can choose the, you know, the eccentricity. You can choose how, you know, uh, concentrated or how diffuse is. And just by convolution, you know that uh, convoluting, right, functions with, uh, you know, regular functions, you generate a systematic way of regularizing objects, right? So in mathematics, you are, you know, you are um, already aware of the existence of um, uh, the fact that uh, if you take a function rho, which is in L1 of Rd, uh, which is uh, non-negative and um, so that the integral of rho over rd is equal to one, right? And now out of this function rho, you define a new sequence rho 
epsilon x, which is one over epsilon to the power d, rho x over d, right? This sequence of functions rho epsilon, as epsilon go to zero, they converge to what? What is the limit of this sequence? Which is concentrating more and more and more and more. Does anyone know? Is the Dirac delta good? So is the Dirac? Sorry, should be the Dirac Dirac delta. Okay. So this is a limit process in which uh, the energy of the Gaussian that is first very dispersed, like in the yellow one, then is getting more concentrated, more concentrated than in the blue one. Eventually in the limit, all the mass is concentrated at a point, right? And this is what, uh, you know, is the traditional process that we can use in order to prove, right, density, right? This is the traditional way of proving density in all books in uh, applied analysis for partial differential equations, in the sense that uh, you know this will this lemma will tell you if you have f which is in LP of R D and P is between one and infinity, then out of f and convoluting it with uh, the uh, approximation of the identity I have defined here, you get a sequence f epsilon, and this sequence f epsilon has two properties. Every f epsilon is in same infinity, so I don't need any information on the on the smoothness of f. F being an integrable function suffices, measurable and integrable function suffices. If I make convolution with this approximation of the identity. I get sequences of functions f epsilon that are same infinity as move, right? But but not only they are same infinity as move, but actually they converge to f in LP, right? This is the classical, the most classical way of proving density properties that play a fundamental role in many areas of analysis, in particular in partial differential equations and in approximation theory, right? Okay, good. So in some sense, right, when we are doing this, we know that uh, basically the role that this, uh, say, uh, approximation of the identity is playing is that if you give me a function, say, f, which is uh, something like this, is the characteristic function of an interval, right? If you now consider f convoluted by rho epsilon, what you are doing is simply you are is moving out the angles of this characteristic function. So to make the transitions to be same infinity as smooth without you know, really modifying the, the shape of the function too much in the sense that the convergence will be guaranteed. Uh, by the way, uh, you see here that I said P between one, including one, uh, but not uh, infinity. Do you know why I have excluded here in this density statement the fact that P might be infinity? Uh, this is because I forgot or? Is this density result true when I consider the case of the exponent p equal infinity? What is p equal infinity? What is the Lebesgue space when p is equal to infinity? It changes a little bit, right? So f being in LP, we know what it is, right? So f being in LP simply means that the integral of f to the power p is finite. But when P is infinity, the nature of this space changes. And what you know F being in an infinity means is that F is uniformly bounded. Right? So you know the norm in L infinity, right? The norm 
in L infinity, right, is the norm of uniform convergence, right? And therefore, therefore, what I'm saying here, when I claim, if my claim will be that there is convergence in L infinity, it will mean that the sequence of functions f epsilon is converging to f uniformly. But we know, and we know this from the first year, say, calculus cars in, uh, in our bachelor program in mathematics, we know that the uniform convergence of continuous functions always leads to a continuous function. So meaning that the only chance that you can, you know, in L infinity, you can approximate a function f by a smooth function f epsilon is that the function f you are trying to approximate itself is continuous. And because there are functions like the characteristic function of an interval, in L infinity, which are discontinuous, they are not continuous, you cannot claim this density lemma in LP for P equal infinity. Okay? So fine. This is, you say, this is approximation theory. This is density. This is about the Lebesgue spaces. You can do the same in Sobolev spaces. And you say, well, but what, what this has to do with control? What this has to do with noise reduction? Well, it does, right? Because actually, uh, in this, uh, sorry, in this image I was showing you here, one is very close to the other, right? And the only thing I have done when moving from this noisy image to the improved one, right? This is precisely what you try to do when you take a picture. I mean, you, you take your telephone, you take a picture, and then you, you know, when you observe it, you say, well, it's a little bit noisy, maybe it needs more light, or maybe I need to, re to reduce the, the noise in order to improve it. You use some kind of Photoshop device, which is nowadays built in, you know, the, the, the photo capturing program. So you don't claim another program, you just do it within the, you know, the, the app you are using for taking the picture, but it's built in. What you are doing is you are simply applying some you know a small gauss convolution in order to remove all these very uh, little irregularities as moving the picture out but without of course removing right the main feature of, of this of the of the of the photo right so so we don't want a, a gaussian that you know, when, when reducing the noise that there is, you know, the underlying high frequency noise that is underlying the picture everywhere, we don't want a Gaussian that will also identify the eye, right, with noise and we'll simply remove it. Okay, so we need really, you know, very gentle, say, Gaussian processes that will be able, as indicated here, to regularize you know, the shape regularizing a little bit, but without really losing the main features of this shape. Okay, good. Okay, but uh, is this related to control? Well, yes, in some sense, yes. So we said noise reduction, right? Acoustic noise that is active control through say sensors and actuators in a feedback manner. This has a lot to do with uh, say dynamical systems, this is like when you are driving a car, right? When you drive a car, you are doing an active control, right? It's true. I mean, before you leave home, you say, oh, let me check what is the, the best road. Okay, and then you will check, you know, in internet and try to look for the best road. But once you are on the road, you are on the car, you will have to, you know, constantly you know, drive your car. You cannot simply rely on the initial, say, design you did for the road because you never know what's gonna happen. Maybe you were planning the road, but you didn't take into account that it will be raining very heavily or that there will be a heavy traffic or that there will be a traffic jump, which is an impediment for you to, you know, to take the planned road. Okay, so this is clearly related to control. Passive control is related to design. And then as you see, 
in, in mathematical control theory, we are not only interested on, say, very sophisticated results. We are also interested on very, say, fundamental concepts like the Gaussian convolution, which are very robust, very stable, no so hard to manipulate, right? So that, you know, here, by just choosing the variance of this Gaussian, you can achieve your goal in an optimal way without too much sophistication. Right? So you know also that, you know, every, every each of us that now has a cell phone, right? Uh, you know, the, the cell phone has infinitely many features. I mean, you could spend all your life reading about all the possible functionalities of your cell phone. But we rarely do that. If you offer me, I mean, if you are offered a new uh, telephone, you will simply turn it on and we'll start playing with it. And you will try to learn how to operate the basic functions like uh, email, WeChat, telephone calls, photos, or videos. You will try to learn how to operate with it with a minimal complexity. This is what you want, right? So you see that this is in the context of of the philosophy of science, this is the classical principle of the Occam razor that says, you see, the best mathematical model, the best mathematical technique is not the most sophisticated one. It's actually the one that is able to provide sufficiently good results with minimal complexity. Why? Because when the complexity is minimal, it's much easier to be communicated to others, to be explained, to be learned by others, to be employed by others, is much more robust, is, is much easier to regulate the different parameters of the process because it's simple, is more intuitive, is computationally much cheaper. If you have to do numerical approximations, it's always much easier to do numerical approximations of a model that is not so sophisticated. And therefore, you know, according to the philosophy of science, the best model when we are facing any application to natural sciences or technology or engineering is not necessarily the most sophisticated one, but it's actually that one which makes an optimal compromise between, say, uh, accuracy and simplicity. Okay, and this is why principles like the Gaussian regularization as a fundamental device in order to reduce noise are one of the milestones of control theory. Some people will say this has nothing to do with control theory, this is just uh, approximation, or this is maybe people will say, no, 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 this is related to random walks, and this is related to Brownian motion. And this is related to statistics. Okay, all this is true, but it's also very much, you know, the foundations of control theory. Now, when you look to control theory nowadays, how do you formulate things? You know, in a more mathematical way. You say, well, I have a system. What is your system about? So why, for instance, is the temperature in the different rooms in the building? So we are in the mathematical building here. And then there are 100 offices and classrooms. So then there is a vector y with, uh, with 100 components. y1, temperature in room one, y2, temperature in room two, y3, temperature in room three, and so on. A vector of 100 components. And they are somehow interrelated, right? Because there, is, there are common walls, there are doors open, heat is being you know, communicating from one room to the other is being transported, is being diffused. So this gives me a large system. So whenever I design a, a building, a complex building, I am designing a system which is given by this big operator A that can be a matrix. It can be simply the, you know, the connectivity matrix that is telling me how quickly heat is being communicated from one room to another. There will be also many zeros in this matrix, right? Because probably the, the office in the first floor has, you know, no connection at all with the office in the, in the, in the floor number 20. There will be plenty of zeros. 
But it's true also that neighboring rooms, they were very much be interrelated in terms of temperature. There will be also many ones in this matrix, okay? You can also decide to make this model nonlinear. You can make it static. You can make it dynamic. So normally in mathematics, right? So we are often, you know, concerned about solving these kind of equations. Does this equation has a solution? Is this solution unique? How complicated this solution is, right? So can I develop numerical algorithms to compute these solutions? This is the kind of problems we look in mathematics typically, right? So this can be a linear system, A1 equal B. And then, you know, if you are in the context of matrices, you can say, well, then the solution will be Y equal A minus one B. But Y could also be a differential equation, Y prime T plus uh, Y T equal to one, for instance, with some initial datum. This will be the Cauchy problem for an ordinary differential equation. Or maybe it's the heat equation, right? So maybe this is, we are dealing with temperature in the, in the Euclidean space, right? During time or in a manifold, right? And then, right, we are dealing with a heat equation in which, you know, the solution is a, a PDE. This is an ODE. And this is simply a, a, a linear algebra, right? Linear system. So this is what we do most of the time, right? When you learn about a linear algebra, ordinary differential equations, partial differential equations, you are precisely focusing on how to solve this system. And the questions are existence of solutions, uniqueness of solutions, qualitative properties of solutions like smoothness, periodicity, stability, right? And then finally, numerical approximation of solutions, okay? But control theory is going one step further, right? Because in control theory, you also say, well, I have the system, but other than the system evolving spontaneously, I have also the opportunity to act on the system, right? As we have seen before, you know, in this problem of noise control, we were able to inject anti-noise. In this problem of temperature diffusing in the building, we have also heating in the winter and we have air conditioning in the summer. So we can play with an external added source or force, right? To regulate the solution inside, okay? And therefore, then this problem that was originally just about solving equations, now is about trying to drive the solution of the system to the desired configuration. So we want, for instance, traffic flow. If you are regulating traffic on highways, you want all cars to, follow, to flow with a more or less, uh, say, uniform velocity of 120 kilometers per hour and separated by a distance of, I don't know, 15 meters for safety. This will be the ideal configuration, right? Unfortunately, Oftentimes, this is not the case, in particular in big cities where you have huge uh, traffic jams in peak hours, right? But the ideal configuration will be all cars 120 kilometers per hour. If I was dealing with the, the temperature in the math building where there are 100 offices and lecture rooms and library and so on, I would like this vector Y with 100 components, all the components to be 21 degrees, 21 degrees, 21 degrees, 21, 21, 21, the constant vector 21. Okay, so the game to play now is that not only is about simply you give me the system and I solve it, but now the game is more complicated. You have the system, but you also have the possibility of regulating the right-hand side term B. And what you want is not only given B to be able to compute the Y, but also to be able to guess what is the B that you will need to employ so that Y takes the configuration you want, the configuration you have given a priori because it's the one you need, right? You need, I mean, if you are regulating 
the economy of a country, uh, you want a constant, more or less uh, monotonic growth of the economy. And this requires that the inflation rate is not too high. So you need to keep inflation between say zero and maybe 2%. And, and you want, you know, a, a, a redistribution of wealth, you know, all along the country to make sure that, you know, all the growth is say more or less balanced in order to avoid uh, large oscillations and so on, right? In any context of application, these kind of problems uh, make sense. But of course, then how complex the model is, the problem is depends very much on the model you choose. As I have said, you could take linear models or non-linear. And here there is always an interplay, right? It's like uh, the Occam razor in the context of the philosophy of science. You could say, well, linear models are not that accurate because there are many processes that are non-linear in nature, right? An earthquake, an earthquake is not a linear process. With a linear process, maybe you can analyze the vibrations of the, of the drum, of the membrane when you play music. This is maybe linear, right? Linear acoustics. But when you are dealing with an earthquake, uh, this is uh, certainly a very nonlinear process. Okay, then you know some people will say, "Well, but doing linear systems, linear is too simple. You will never be able to deal with very sophisticated applications." It's true, but now when you are dealing with nonlinear, maybe the control of the nonlinear system will be much more complicated, and maybe you will not even be able to give you know to get a hint of what the controls of the nonlinear system will be. So this is why, even though, even though when you believe that the system under consideration truly should be nonlinear, oftentimes it's uh, very, very useful to first deal with a simplified linear system. The same about deterministic and stochastic. So we, we oftentimes we model processes in a deterministic manner. Then the experts in stochastic analysis will tell you, well, but the wall is never deterministic. You never know what's going to happen, right? So now I'm lecturing here with you, but maybe if uh, internet is gone here in the building where I am in Autonoma de Madrid, then if internet is gone, I cannot continue my lecture, right? I'm, I have planned my lecture as a deterministic system in which I will have three hours of constant internet high quality, high speed, wireless internet so that I can communicate with you in an efficient manner for three hours, non-stop, fine, no rush. We have three hours, it's plenty of time. We can discuss many things, but yes, people will tell you, but you know, Enrique, uh, the world is not deterministic. Anything might happen. Maybe there is a track passing by and then it breaks down, you know, the, the wireless, uh, you know, uh, emitter and, and then, uh, you know, the internet will be gone in the building then I have to stop. So then it will be a stochastic. Or you could say, well, I really don't know what to do because I was uh, learning many, many years about partial differential equations. I know, you know, that partial differential equations like Schrodinger equations, Corteveit debris equations, Navier Stokes equations, the system of elasticity, uh, viscoelasticity, thermoelasticity. There are many, many models that are very much adapted to describing the evolution of continuous media and nature, but they are extremely complicated. They are so complicated that, as you know, the existence and uniqueness of solutions of Navier Stokes is not known in free space dimensions. This is one of the problems of the Clay Foundation that I will mention later. So you could, you could really you know, use infinite dimensional systems, but then you might struggle because you will not even know whether there is a solution, how regular this solution is. So then you see, people will tell you, you see, I told you, rather than employing a very sophisticated infinite dimensional system, you should use a finer dimensional system. It's true, it's going to be less accurate, but then you will be able to handle it. And in a finite time, you will be able to provide a good result, right? Okay, so this is just a, a matter of 
uh, say, part of the process. So you see that in the context of control theory, the first thing that you as a scientist approaching a topic, a problem related with control applications, the first thing you will have to do is to make choices about the models you employ. And please keep always this in mind. You know, it's not necessarily about building the most sophisticated model so to be able to apply the most complicated and recent mathematical techniques or theorems. It's about, you know, making guaranteeing that the whole process is optimal. And optimal is always a compromise between efficiency and simplicity. Okay, good. Now, then, then there are, uh, once you make these choices, you are in the context of control. And sometimes you say, well, but is this really control theory? Is this optimization theory? Is this linear programming? Is this calculus of variation? So you see there are many different areas of analysis and applied mathematics that uh, more or less have the same goal. The goal being always to optimally design, to optimize the management of a given infrastructure, of a given process. Uh, it's about you know, guaranteeing good performance. And then, depending on which modeling you adopt, the problem will look more like a calculus of variation problem. Calculus of variation is more about passive, say, control, as I was mentioning before. It's more about the optimal choice of the geometry and the materials. While if you adopt a dynamical system perspective, right? then like the driver of the you know of the car on the highway then this is a clearly a, a dynamical system in which you have to be acting all the time you are the sensor and you are the actuator this is why it's so important when you are driving you are not talking on the phone or reading your wechat because you are as a driver you are the sensor and you are the actuator and you have to be fresh and awake and focused and concentrated so to be able to react to any possible unexpected incident because as we said the wall is not deterministic when you let check the the road in internet you get a, a passive photo an static photo it's like if the wall was purely deterministic you say how to drive from Changchun to beijing and then you have the road Yes, this is true, but this is not the complete truth because this doesn't tell you what is the traffic, whether that day there has been some accident, whether there was a very bad weather and all the kind of things that might happen, right? The gas station is closed and then you are running out of gasoline or the, you know, the autobahn, the highway is closed and you have to go by the old road. You never know. The real thing is never completely deterministic. So you are in an active mode, and therefore you are in a context of dynamical systems. Now, as I said, in most of the processes we have to handle, the control needs to enter in a feedback manner. Why? Because for instance, now, so today here is now 9 a.m. here, now, you know, it's warming up, right? It's warming up. The air conditioning in my office was off because until now it was not hot, but now, you know, the sun, you know, is increasing intensity. The temperature is, you know, is increasing and eventually soon the air conditioning will turn on, right? So this is a feedback process. It's a process in which the sensor is measuring all the time. It doesn't mean that the actuator has to be actuated. No, 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 it's fine. So by now it's fine. The, you know, the temperature is below 21. So while the temperature is below 21, the sensor is measuring every say minute or so. Okay, temperature 20, temperature 19, temperature 20.5, temperature 20.9, everything is fine. And then the control is at zero, nothing happens, no actuation. No need to actuate because we are below the threshold given. 
But now that the sun is racing and the temperature is increasing at a given time, the sensor will say, oh, temperature 21.3. Then immediately the actuator has to turn on in a feedback manner. It means in that case that in those systems, right? You have the state, you have the state of the system, the temperature. We have the control, which is at our disposal. We can use V positive or negative to push the temperature up and down. So this is the control. It's a force, it's a source. It's an actuation that you can really, you know, choose. And then in the context of feedback control, the important say feature is that the control itself has to be related to the state of the system. So according to the state, oftentimes you don't have a full access to the state. You have only access to partial measurements of the state out of the sensors. You will determine what the control is. This will introduce a feedback law, and this is why we call it capital F. And then when you inject this low feedback low into the control V, then you will get a new system. And then you see that the new system will look something like A minus F composition with capital F applied to Y equals zero. After all, when you are moving from a passive system to an optimal, say, uh, feedback control paradigm, you are modi modifying the original system that was simply, you know, the A system, you are modifying it by adding the impact of the control. And in this way, you get a system that maybe uh, before it was unstable, and now the system is stabilized, right? So this is like what happens in economies. I mean, economies that are, you know, unstable, inflation is maybe 40%, uh, the currency is devaluated, jobs are lost, you know, uh, poverty propagates, while when the economy is well regulated, inflation is low, there is a more or less homogeneous growth, and in a, you know, five, ten years frame, you can really observe the positive evaluation, evolution of cities, towns, regions, and so on. Okay, good. So the concept of feedback is certainly one of the central ones in the context of control theory. Okay, so in principle, you will control the system, maybe in an open loop manner, meaning giving yourself a time horizon to act. But then eventually when you go down to applications, your, your goal will always or nearly always be to make the control to be in a feedback manner. And you see that in, in many applications. So the thermostat is the first application I mentioned. You see, feedback in the, in the thermostat. But you also, when you take an airplane, and then of course, you see, when you are taking the, the airplane from say, from Beijing to, for instance, uh, Frankfurt or, or Munich, right? Beijing, Frankfurt in Germany, then it's a 10 hours flight, right? Okay. And then there are basically three, three different, say, sub intervals that you have to differentiate, right? There is the takeoff, this is a very delicate operation in which you, you take this airplane from, you know, from, uh, you know, the airport in, in Beijing and you have to put it in a few minutes, you have to put it at a height of 10 kilometers, right? And with, a, say, a speed of, I don't know, 900 kilometers per hour. So this is the takeoff. Then, but this takes maybe half an hour. Then you have a long segment of nine hours in which the airplane is flying in a constant velocity in a stable manner, trying to avoid turbulences and so on, right? And during this time, people simply watch movies, sleep, or eat dinner. And then there is the landing phase, right? Where again, is very active, you know, the captain of the airplane, you know, talks to the people, you should put on your belt, uh, you should be careful, uh, redress your seat, right? Uh, open the windows. Uh, there are plenty of actions that are undertaken before the, you know, the airplane uh, lands. This takes, again, half an hour. But out of these 10 hours, except for the first half, hour, half an hour of landing 
sorry, of taking off and the last half an hour of landing, the nine hours the, the airplane is moving, right? In a feedback manner, basically, you know, in an automatic mode. Right. So, of course, the captain, the commandant is there in order to intervene in case there is some emergency or something unexpected happens, because, as we said, nothing is deterministic in life. There are always unexpected events. But other than that, other than that, the flight most of the time is driven in a purely uh, automatic mode. OK, good. Another key concept, however, and we will see uh, the, the necessity of this in our lectures as well, is that, you see, we as humans, we, we have the intuition that if I have to go from point A to point B, then, uh, okay, of course, uh, you know, the, the simplest is always to take the straight line. Okay, it happens often that even if this is our goal, Right. In practical applications of control, uh, this is not possible. And this is not possible simply oftentimes because, you know, we are here in A uh, and this is where I want to go in B. Uh, but it turns out that there is a column here. Right. And therefore, I cannot, uh, you know, I cannot travel in a straight way. I have to rather, you know, the optimal path will be something that is turning around. There is a fluctuation, there is an oscillation. So this is a, a very important concept. The fact that for most of the systems to be controllable, you know, we need to allow for fluctuations of the system. So there is a, I mean, this is a, one of the first essays on the governance and governing mechanisms. I mean, this is precisely about the stability of the, of the ball regulator mechanism of the steam engine that plays such an important role in industrial revolution. This was about simply the analysis of the dynamical stability of a dynamical system related to this engineering device. I will mention some mathematics of that later today, right? But, you know, in this book, it is already said, this is also a very interesting book for, the, for an introduction to the history of control theory at that early time, right? What uh, Hall says is the following. It, say, it says, it is a curious fact that while political economists recognize that for the proper action of the law of supply and demand, there must be fluctuations, right? So we know that if you don't let the economy to fluctuate a little bit, it's very hard to make it uh, performing well, right? You need to somehow regulate, you know, the flow of goods, of prices, according to the will of people, right? So he says, it is curious that while in political economics, so the economists by that time, they knew in their way, right? They knew in their way that fluctuations were needed in order to, you know, optimize the function of the economies, right? Uh, it has not been generally recognized by mechanicians in this matter of the steam engine governor. Okay, we will explain that a little bit later, but somehow some concepts that were already realized by economists in social sciences, uh, just out of uh, intuition, say without the same level of mathematical sophistication and rigor, but they were able to guess this, to realize that fluctuations were needed in order to control systems. It took some more time in the classical context of engineering applications of control, in the context of, say, mechanics, say, classical or continuum mechanics to realize that. Okay, we'll come back to this. So, uh, but as I said, uh, you know, keywords like uh, fluctuations, complexity uh, are always present in control theory. Why? Because, as I said before, most often this very simple idea that uh, if I want to go from A to B, I have to right do it in a in a straight line manner. Uh, 
uh, this is often not possible. Sometimes, you know, life is complicated. You have to oscillate a lot in order to get from A to B, to go from origin to destination, okay? Simply because there might be plenty of obstacles here, right, here and there that you cannot get through. You have to simply turn around, overcome. And therefore the path can be lengthier. It might be more tiring, but I mean, you, you finally do it. This is what is really relevant, right? So this is already observed when you are dealing with Lagrange multipliers. So this is a topic we also know very well, right? So from the bachelor program. It's simply about minimizing a function over the level set of another function gx equals z. So you see, if we are simply minimizing a function, right, in the full space, right, what is the criticality condition here? The criticality condition is very simple. We say, well, I really don't mind whether I am minimizing or maximizing, right? I know that at every critical point, right, the tangent has to be horizontal, right? And this means simply that the gradient of f of x is equal to zero, okay? So then, you know, when we take calculus one, and calculus two, calculus one, maybe in one space variable, calculus two in two space variable, in multiple space variables, it's a bit more complicated because you don't have only one derivative, you have partial derivatives, you have gradients as vectors, but the concept is very much the same. If you have a function f, which is of class C1, and you are minimizing computing the extremals of these functions, these extremals are always hidden within the class of critical points and critical points are those in which the gradient of the function is equal to zero. Of course, the, the, the fact that the gradient of the function is equal to zero, it doesn't mean that I have a minimizer because it could also be a, a maximum or, or it could be a saddle point, right? Then I have to first identify the class of critical points and then basically check what is the sign, right? Once I have a critical point, and we'll check the sign of the second derivative to determine whether this is a minimum or a maximum, okay? Of course, this is the, the classical problem. But what Lagrange observed is that oftentimes in practical applications, we are not in such a nice situation in which I am minimizing a function in the free space. It could well be that I have to minimize the function over a set which is given as a restriction of another function. What is the set of X, right? So the question is now, what is the set of X such that GX is equal to C? Well, this is a level set. What do we mean by a level set? We mean that, you know, we are given a function G, right? could be, for instance, this, this Gaussian. And then you are giving me a height, a level, right? A level C. And therefore, you know, the level set can simply be the projection over RD of this set in which the function G is taking the value C. And you say, well, now, uh, now I am not dealing with a free problem. I'm simply dealing with the problem restricted to this level set. So now I am not interested on the variations of F in all possible directions. Actually, I am only interested on the possible variations of F in the direction of G, right? On the direction of this level set. And then Lagrange said, well, then it's clear. If you want a critical point for such a function restricted to this level set, the condition has to be that the gradient of F is equal to lambda gradient of G. And this simply means that the gradient of F, sorry. This simply means Sorry for this. This simply means that the gradient of f at x is parallel to the gradient of g at x. So 
how do you explain that in this context of the minimization of F submitted to constraints, the optimality condition, the criticality condition is not any more gradient F. Sorry again. I'm touching something. Okay, so the condition is not anymore gradient of f of x is equal to zero. This is insufficient when you are dealing with constraint problem. The condition is that the gradient of f of x is parallel to the gradient of g of x. Why is that? What is the gradient of what is the gradient of g of x representing when I am talking about the level set of the function? gx equals c. Do you know that? Maybe you can tell me on the chat. Do you know what the gradient of g represents when you are considering the set, the level set where g is equal to a given constant c? How is this vector gradient G is the normal direction? Very good, very good. Chang Kinje, thank you. So this is perpendicular. So if I draw it again, because my drawing was gone, if I draw again the function G, this is the graph of the function, right? So this will be the function, say, uh, Y equal G of X. And then I take the level set, say, Right, this is the level set. The projection of this level set will give me this, say, uh, ellipse. This is the level set g x equal z, which is just I take the surface of the graph of the function and I do a cut, a cross section, horizontal at the height z. This gives me a, you know, a hypersurface, a, a curve. If I am dealing with functions f or g from r two into r, right? And this has a projection. This is the level set, right? This is really the level set is embedded into RD, right? Of course, this level set in general, generically, will be a smooth hypersurface, and it has a normal vector. This normal vector is precisely given by the gradient of G. So why the gradient of G is pointing in the normal direction? Chankin, can you can you explain us why the gradient is pointing in the normal direction? Why not, for instance, in the tangent direction? Why is the gradient pointing in the normal direction? Well, the reason is very simple. So you know that, uh, you know, this is the level set. The level set is the set of x's in Rd where g is equal to c. Therefore, if this level set is this yellow, say, kind of ellipsoid, right. OK, yeah. So yeah, Chankin is telling uh, is telling us that he doesn't have a microphone, but Nate uh, Natarajan gave the, the right answer because it is the direction of a steepest ascent. Yeah, let me explain this. You see, imagine you are walking along this path. You are walking along this path, and then you know that when you are walking along this path, the height, right? The height on the surface, right, is constant. Because whenever you walk along this path, g is a constant, it means that the derivative in the direction tangent to this path is going to be zero. 
So within the level set, the tangential gradient of G, which is just the gradient of G multiplied scalarly by any tangent vector. So here, basically, there is only one tangent direction. But if you were in a higher dimensional space, there will be a hypersurface of dimension D minus 1. And then you will have D minus 1 tangent vectors. But it doesn't matter in which direction of a tangent vector you are, you are walking. I mean, you are always G equals C. So you walk, you walk in any direction of this hypersurface level set. And you don't see any difference because G is always equal to Z. So whenever you compute the tangent derivatives, right? the tangent derivatives are vanishing because, oh, I'm sorry again. The tangent derivatives are vanishing, right? The tangent derivatives are vanishing. Because, you know, whenever you walk in the level set, the variation of G doesn't simply exist. So if all the projections of G into all tangent vectors are equal to zero, what does it mean? If given a surface, right? Could be an sphere, for instance. If you have an object so that, you know, whenever you project into the tangential directions, this vector field has null projection, the only chance that this vector field survives is that the vector field is pointing in the perpendicular direction. And this was the intuition of Lagrange. Lagrange said, be careful. Oftentimes in control theory, in optimization problems, in the calculus of variation, we are not simply, we are not simply dealing with a function to be minimized. That's too simple. If we are minimizing a function from Rd into R, then the minimum of F is always hidden on the set of critical points where the gradient is equal to zero. But oftentimes, you have constraints. For instance, if you say, well, uh, if there is no money constraint, if I have to travel, well, I take uh, any, the first airplane. But if I have constraints, maybe I cannot take the first airplane because the airplane, for instance, you know, if you try to travel from, say, uh, Madrid to Bilbao, where many people go for the weekend because of the beaches and the nature and so on, if you try to travel Friday afternoon, maybe the tickets will be very expensive. But if you travel tomorrow morning, Saturday morning, the tickets will be less expensive. Why? Because people traveling for the weekend, they all try to travel Friday afternoon. So if you there is no constraints, okay, take the first airplane. But maybe the first airplane, you know, Friday afternoon is 10 times more expensive as the fly tomorrow at uh, 8 a.m. because nobody likes uh, waking up 5.30 Saturday morning, right? But then if I have constraints, right? If I am really have a limited budget, I cannot simply say, that the optimum is given by the gradient. The optimum is not given by the gradient, but is given by this more sophisticated condition. And this is what makes somehow is related also to this need of fluctuations is that, I mean, our first intuition is always, is often wrong, right? This is actually what is, uh, uh, you know, behind the ABS uh, braking mechanism, automatic braking me mechanisms of the car. What is human intuition? You are driving on the highway, 120 kilometers per hour, and then there is a dog crossing. What is the human in intuition? The human intuition is you brake, you know, in a dry manner, you know, very strongly, you brake. What happens then? It happens then that the, the car is destabilized, you lose control of the car and then you undergo an accident and probably something very bad happened. Maybe the dog passes by, but you as a driver and your accompanying persons on the car undergo a very severe accident. This is human intuition. I, I needed to break. So then what I do is I push very strongly with plus infinity control. This is a very bad idea. What does the ABS brake do? It does the same 
it does something similar, but more sophisticated. It does a bank bank control, bank of bank. It's an intermittent control. It doesn't do plus infinity, it does 10, 0, 10, 0, 10, 0 very rapidly. Something that for us is not intuitive and it's even hard to do because we cannot really, you know, we cannot break. We are not able agile enough to, especially in these emergency situations to, you know, to divide the few, say, seconds we have into milliseconds or deciseconds to act in such a sophisticated manner. But this is what the ABS break does for us is because our first intuition was simply gradient equal to zero. And then the ABS break says, no, 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 no. You are forgetting Lagrange. You should not forget Lagrange. The optimum is not gradient of F is equal to zero. The optimum is gradient of F parallel to the gradient of G. Why? Because there are constraints. And why there are constraints? Well, because you want your car not to break. You want the car to not to lose control. You don't want to quit the highway. You don't want to go undergo an accident. Okay. And this is why, you know, oftentimes, because of the intrinsic, you know, constraints of the system or the extrinsic outer constraints imposed by the control application, the optimal control strategies are often sophisticated and not so intuitive. And this is why you need mathematics to discover what these optimal strategies are. Okay. Then, as I said, the number of applications is, is huge. In some applications, you will see in uh, engineering books that they talk about the state space or the frequency domain. This is simply because, you know, from a modeling, mathematical modeling perspective, there are you know, there is always the Fourier transform, right? Fourier transform, Laplace transform, say Fourier analysis, generally speaking. Uh, you can always, you know, we know that there is the Plancher lemma that, that says that if you have a function in the in the physical space, say, um, I mean, if you give me um, a function from Rd into R, then out of this function, I can also consider the function, the dual function, right? Uh, here, the variable, oh, sorry, right? So out of a function, f of x, out of a function, f of x, I can also consider the corresponding Fourier transform uh, f hat sigma or xi. And then we know that by Plancherel, right? Plancherel Parseval, right? We know that, for instance, the L2 norm of the function f, right, in Rd is equal to the integral over Rd of the Fourier transform. So, what does this mean? It means that you can see the same amount of energy, the same deformations, the same dynamics, the same performance you can see within the physical space of X for position and time for time in the state space, you can see the same in the Fourier frequency domain on the dual variables C for the dual variable of space X and Tau for the dual variable of time T, right? And then because you see the same, depending on the kind of application you are handling, it can be more interesting working in the space F or in the space F hat. And very often in applications, you combine both, right? This is what, for instance, wavelets do, or this is what uh, the micro local analysis does, right? So you localize in a space time. This is something very intuitive for us, right? Because now I say, oh, now is 9.36. I localize in time. And I am sitting in my office in Madrid. So then I am localizing myself in a space. I localize in a space time. This is very intuitive for us because we have a clear intuition of, of, of positioning, of landscape, of our collocation, right? Of slopes and so on. And then time also, we have an intuition about time, although we need the watches in order to, you know, to compute the time. 
for us it's harder to track the time that uh, tracking a space, right? So clearly humans, we distinguish a space and time, right? And this is why in mathematics, often when we write equations, partial differential equations, we distinguish the space variable X and the time variable T. We don't do it just for mathematical purposes. It's because our understanding of the world clearly distinguishes space and time. Okay, good. So we can do that localized in space time in the physical space. But then in order to better understand the signal at the formation, oftentimes through Fourier analysis, through microlocal analysis, uh, wavelets and so on, we also localize in the, in the frequency space. Why? Because the more you localize is like the more your sensor is accurate, right? The more your sensor is precise and can focus on a specific feature. So to provide better and better and better information about your, you know, the process you are considering, the more information you have, the more, the better you can actuate on it. And then the range of applications of these very early concepts of control theory that, as you see, are related to very philosophical questions about the Occam razor for modeling, uh, complexity theory, uh, fluctuations, the concept of feedback, Lagrange multipliers, things that are elementary nowadays considered as elementary, although it took centuries to humans to develop that, right? So you see Aristoteles, 2,400 years back, he was already saying in some sense, oh, you see, you should do control theory. He didn't call it that way. He mentioned the necessity of make humans free uh, through the automatic, say, uh, evolution of processes, intrinsic evolution of processes, it took, you know, 2,000 years to get from that point to the Lagrange multipliers, right? Nowadays, you know, and this started after the Second World War, you know, the aerospace industry, uh, eolic, you know, green energies, uh, renewable energies, uh, marine energies, energy, is uh, indeed one of the key applications, aerodynamics, astronautics and aerodynamics. And here I have taken another picture. This is, I have mentioned before how the American SIAM, Society for Industrial and Applied Mathematics in the year 2003, uh, they wrote a report on the state uh, of the art in control. So there are uh, two SIAM reports in control. Cyan reports in control. One was published in 88, and the other one was published in 2003. Uh, I think you can also download uh, this one that was coordinated by Wendell Fleming. It was again a collective work with different contributions by different experts in different various areas of mathematical control theory. And at, at that time, the, the title of the, of the report was Future Directions in Control Theory, a Mathematical Perspective. You see that it's very much mathematical driven. And you see here uh, the, the photo of a space station in order to identify some of the future challenges that control theory will be dealing with, right? And you see here, I mean, that uh, there are plenty of constraints. Uh, you see complexity you see geometry, you get intuition about uh, optimal shapes, about optimal dynamics, everything is built in. There is, of course, uncertainty. You have to, you know, uh, accept that probably the space mission will not behave exactly as uh, expected, not either as in the movies where, you know, when you look to the movies, there is always some catastrophe, not necessarily but it's not completely deterministic either, right? So you need also a lot of, say, stochasticity. There are other applications like uh, seismic waves, uh, earthquakes. Uh, so this article I have taken here, the title in French, but uh, the article is also published in English by Cotton and Barr. So in this article, they explain very nicely uh, why in the, in the French city of uh, Grenoble, right, in France, right? 
they were observing that uh, the city uh, was very sensitive to earthquakes in an unexpected manner, right? And, uh, and of course, they were interested on this because in particular, the city hall and the government of the region uh, was interested on, okay, so how are, you know, the buildings will resist in case there is an earthquake. So I remember the first time I visited my, my colleague and friend, Shu Sang, it was, I don't know, 15 years back or so. It was soon after the, the, the earthquake uh, in Sichuan, right? Uh, and then I have seen that in the building of mathematics, there were on the walls, there were some cracks. But the building was fine. I mean, the global structure of the building was fine. There were some, some cracks in some of the walls, but these cracks were not major, were just some external manifestations of the, of the huge vibrations that the building underwent. But the building was standing and it was perfect and we could even use it. And I mean, the building is of course, nowadays is still there and these cracks are now are, are, are just uh, decorated. They are not visible anymore, right? So this was an, a building that was well designed, was well conceived, was, was solid enough, was well built so that it was able to you know, undergo this huge uh, earthquake in Sichuan, not that far from the Chengdu city, didn't affect the university building, right? So this is the concern of in Grenoble region. You know, they have the records and they say, well, we didn't expect this. It turns out that this town, for some reason, the, you know, the impact of earthquakes on buildings is higher than expected. And then uh, Cotton and, and Bard, uh, as leaders of a team of geoscientists, they develop a long program in order to investigate this. And they got to the following conclusion. It turns out that the town of Grenoble, when you get to Grenoble, you get out of the train station, then you see the Alps, the mountains, where you know, people like hiking and skiing. So basically, the city, the town is, right, is uh, built of an, on a, say, sandy territory, right? Okay, this is where the buildings of the town are. Okay, so this is a quite soft land, right? It's a sandy land, but it's surrounded, but it's surrounded by mountains, right? And these mountains are, say, granitic, hard, right? So this material is this material is soft. The, you know, the basement of the city, the town is soft, while the material here is uh, hard, right? Rock. What happens then? It occurs then, as they explain in this uh, article, that as soon as there is some earthquake here, this earthquake travels very fast along the rocky mountains, right? These hard, uh, Granitic material is a medium in which you know the you know the shock waves of the earthquake travel very nicely. This is like a highway, right? For shock waves or the earthquake. This is like a highway for cars. I mean, free traffic, you know, large road, very good quality, no cars, good weather, you drive very fast. This is what waves do. And when when they get into this sandy region in which the city is located, they penetrate in. But once they penetrate in, you know, they basically keep bouncing within the city because once they are in, they get trapped like in a rodeo, they are trapped, right? And the fact that, you know, the material properties, the interface here is from soft to hard, it makes them not possible to go back to the hard material. So it turns out that the contrast of materials, the heterogeneity produces, you know, what? Produces 
concentration of waves and therefore resonances, meaning that the waves remain trapped inside this domain and therefore they keep bouncing and bouncing and bouncing and bouncing and therefore the, you know, uh, an earthquake which had a given amplitude on a Richter scale, the impact of this seismic wave on the buildings in town is amplified, is multiplied, not because the signal was higher, no, no, the signal was of the given, say, magnitude in the Richter scale. It's just because, it's just because, right, this is amplified because of the repetition. Okay, good. Other applications, sorry, I think I'll, okay. Other applications, uh, very interesting applications also. Uh, this has motivated plenty of work on the control of Schrodinger equations is the control of molecular systems. So the control of the molecular systems, you know, is like, uh, you know, in these days there is the Euro Copa, you know, the soccer uh, competition here in Europe. Uh, you know, uh, country selections are, are competing. I think the final is tomorrow or the day after tomorrow, and it's going to be the, the England versus uh, Italy, right? The United Kingdom versus Italy. They are in the final and everyone is following. I mean, many people are following these matches. Indeed, you know, they, they, they play, you know, the way they game play is very sophisticated, is very fast, and it's very beautiful to see, even for those people that are not... Uh, uh, football lovers, right? And here you see more or less the same. So you have a molecular system at rest, right? And then you have three atoms, which is which are uh, interconnected, A, B, Z, right? And then you are designing, you know, you are willing to design a new molecular system, right? And then for you, in the design of the, the new molecular system, it is important to dissociate this uh, system of three atoms interlaced, interconnected three atoms. You want really to split these three atoms into two and one, right? So this is like, you know, when you are with friends, you are uh, say five friends getting out of the restaurant in the evening, and then you take a taxi, and you go to take a taxi and the taxi tells you, no, 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 not five people in the taxi, only three. Okay, then you say, well, we need two taxis, right? So the five people have to divide into two subgroups. Three will take one taxi, taxi number one, two will take taxi number two. Okay, then you have to divide five into three plus two. I mean, that's mathematically is very simple. I mean, socially is more difficult because then you have to de decide who with you are traveling and then maybe you will discuss, well, I go with uh, the people that are living in my neighborhood so that the taxi will make a shorter path, right? So you don't want to, to organize the, the two groups so that, you know, the taxis have to maximize distances because then it will be more expensive. So you try to somehow condensate and make the trip to be minimally complex because then it's going, to, it's going to be cheaper as well. So for you, you have this system of three atoms, right? Three friends attached together and you want to dissociate them, right? And for you, it's important to be able to do it in an intelligent manner so that you can choose whether you will keep this first configuration in which B and C are interconnected and A is isolated or A and B are together and Z is isolated. I mean, this could be also very important in epidemics like now in COVID and so on, where you have groups of people, then some people have shown infection and then you have to decide how you organize, who are the individuals you are isolating, who goes to isolation with whom in order to minimize the risk of further diffusion and propagation, okay? So for you, it's important to be able either to split this way or split this way, okay? So then in this uh, very interesting article about laser design of molecular system, it is explained how basically 
using laser beams, which are like direct delta controls, which are very sharp, very focused on a given time window, very short time window, and very much oriented in a given direction, right? You can act with basically two laser pulses, consecutive laser pulses, as the ABS brake of the car in which you don't do plus infinity, but you rather do 10, 0, 10, 0, 10, 0. So here you just do two kicks like in a soccer game, right? In which the first kick introduces energy on the system. So this system that was at rest, I mean, this system was at rest. If you don't act on the system, this connection A, B, Z will stay forever. It will even become fossile, right? And then, you know, 3,000 years from now, you know, the geologists will explore and they will find, oh, you know, I see these three atoms connected in this configuration ABC. is now a fossil, okay? Good. So now, if you don't do anything, this system will stay at rest forever. Okay, so now you do a first kick, you know, a first laser, you know, very sharp, concentrated, impulsional control, right? The control is basically a direct delta on time, acting on a, you know, very, very narrow time horizon. So you kick the system, you are introducing by this kick, you are introducing energy to the system, and therefore this system starts vibrating, right? Uh, because, you know, the system is vibrating, now the system is visiting many different configurations while evolving, right? This is like a, you know, a, you know, a, a, a satellite, you know, rotating, right? On a system in a more or less periodic manner, right? Okay. Uh, and passing by many different, say, configurations. It can be periodic, it can be more or less ergodic or chaotic, but it's moving anyhow, right? So the system is vibrating. And once the system is vibrating, you are somehow keeping, you know, the system out of this very robust, stable configuration. And you are putting the system in a more fragile situation in which if you choose correctly the time instant in which the second pulse, the second impulsional control, the second direct delta control will act, of course, probably, the way this second pulse is oriented is different. The intensity will also be different. And this is why you see here a very, very narrow Gaussian. So here you see a more spread Gaussian. It means that the kind of control you, you, you employ in the second kick is slightly different with respect to the first one. But because the system now is not at rest, but is rather in this vibrational mode, you will be able to apply the second pole so that depending on how you choose the, this second kick. This first kick is independent. This is just putting, putting energy on the system, right? Sorry. The first kick is just... Ah. Sorry. Where I am? No. The first kick is just putting energy on the system. The second kick is the one that has to be very carefully chosen because depending on how you choose the second kick, then you will get I outside or Z outside. Okay, so then this is the idea. You are getting out of the restaurant. I mean, you were sitting on the table, three people having dinner for two hours. Then you have to put energy on the system. So these people, you know, pay the bill, take the jackets, go outside. They are in motion. And once they are in motion, when it comes to take maybe the motorcycle, oh, there is one motorcycle. Three people cannot go in one motorcycle. Only two can go in the motorcycle. The other one has to take the bus or another motorcycle or the bag or, or the taxi, right? The, the second kick is the one that is more relevant because this will distinguish which is the person that will not take the motorcycle and we have to go along, okay? This is explained in this paper 
very uh, simple, you know, dissemination article that you can find in Scientific American, right? Okay, so these are quite modern applications. There are some others that are very old, like uh, irrigation systems in the ancient Mesopotamia or the Arpenodapta in, in the ancient Egypt, right? So in ancient Egypt, the, the Arpenodapta were, I mean, they were, you know, they were helping, right, to build the pyramids. I mean, the pyramids are, are built in, in desertic areas, you know, very flat areas. And, and in order to guide the constructions, right, the Arpenodapti, the role of the Arpenodapti was to draw very long straight lines on, in the, on the sand, right? So they, they were drawing the lines and these drawings, they were then later used in order to build the paths for transportation of materials or in order to orient, you know, the, the, the basement of the, of the new constructions. So you see, uh, even though, and you see, this is a good example, even though this mathematical concept is very simple, you know, this is like Pythagorean theorem, the minimal distance between two points is always given by the straight line. Even though this is a very basic concept, mathematically, I mean, in practice, it's not so easy to do. You can try yourself, you know, go to a, soccer field, a field, and try to draw a straight line. Of course, if you ask me to do a straight line of a few centimeters or one meter, but of course I can do it. Basically with my hands, I can guess what one meter is and then I can, uh, you know, build a straight line. But if you tell me that I have to build a straight line of a few hundred meters, then things are much more tricky because it's not so easy to orient yourself in space and to walk and draw a line which is really, you know, uh, straight. So very likely, if I do that exercise, I will not get something very straight, but I will get something that is oscillatory. How do you formulate the problem from a mathematical perspective? You see then also in this context, this is a very good example to see why in mathematical control theory, is not only about solving given control problems, but it's also a lot about how do you formulate the control problem? So the answer to the question of what is the shortest path between A and B, right? To give the answer to the question that the shortest path between A and B is just the straight line, you don't need to do any, say, summer course in control theory. This is something we all know. We have an intuition about. And if you need a proof, the only thing you need is the Pythagorean theorem, right? Because the hypotenusa is always, you know, the shortest path, certainly shorter than traveling along this uh, side and then along the other, right? This is just Pythagorean theorem. So you see, very basic geometric concepts allow you to guarantee that the minimal distance between A and B is the straight line. And now you say, well, but you see, I am a, you know, I have learned a lot of analysis and geometry, and I would like to make a more rigorous proof. So then what you will do, you will say, well, you know, you will impress your friends, you will say, no, 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 no. I mean, we don't do that by simple intuition and geometric uh, hand waving and drawing simply a line. I mean, this is too easy. I am a mathematician. I want to, I like to use the mathematics I have learned. So I, how I define the problem of the shortest path? I define the, the, the problem of the shortest path by saying, okay, then what I will do is I will say that an arc, right? Like here, the green one, connecting A and B is a parametrized curve, right? The parameter living in zero one, taking values in RG, in this example, it will be R2, but it could be in the space or in any Euclidean space of higher dimension. I mean, when I am dealing with social networks and there are millions of users, I can be, or in the space of photos, right? A photo has plenty of pixels. So I am in an Euclidean space of a huge dimension, right? Or economies where there are plenty of economic players, right? Interacting, I can be in a 
uh, an Euclidean space of a huge dimension. So I take the parameterized arcs, depending on the parameter t, which plays the role of a parameter, it's not necessarily time, it's just a mathematical parameter, it's a pseudo time, taking values in 0, 1 with values in Rd, under the condition that, well, uh, this path is continuous uh, and is connecting A and B. What does it mean that the path connects A and B? It means that X of zero is equal to A and X of one is equal to B. And then I have to minimize the length. But what is the length of this uh, arc? Well, it's just the integral of the modulus of the velocity vector, right? So if I parameterize this curve, right? So X of T, right? Will be a vector of components X one of T up to X D of T. When I compute the velocity vector X V T, this will be the derivative of X one up to the derivative of X D, right? And then the modulus of this vector V T integrating between the two extremals of the parameter, this gives me the length of the arc. Of the arc, right? Connecting A and B. There are many possible arcs. There is this one, there is this other one, right? There is this other one. Uh, there is this other one, right? There is uh, this other one. Uh, it's clear out of all of them, the shortest path is the straight line, right? But if I, rather than saying this is obvious and that's good enough, and this is what the Abt and other Thai were doing in the, in the classical, in the ancient Egypt, they were able to draw these straight lines in on sand. They were very good at this. They didn't do a master in applied mathematics. They didn't know the calculus of variation. It was not invented yet. Now we put it in the frame of the calculus of variation. And now I have to show that this functional has a minimizer. Now, because I am a mathematician and I have decided to work in this uh, sophisticated concept, context of uh, the calculus of variation, now I have to show that there is a minimizer. Okay, then I say, well, I take the book on the on the calculus of variation. And then uh, this was something that uh, Hilbert in, you know, uh, this was part of the program of Hilbert who said, well, if you want to solve partial differential equations in mechanics, because mechanical systems often follow the law of minimal energy, you should employ the calculus of variation. And then you will see how easily you are able to build solutions of partial differential equations as minimizing energies, he said, in order to do that, you should use Hilbert spaces. Hilbert spaces are those that are given by scalar products, right? And then in these spaces, you are very lucky because bounded sequences, they have weakly converging subsequences. And this allows you to pass to the limit very often under convexity continuity conditions. And this allows you to find minimizers. This is what somehow uh, Hilbert anticipated. It took then a long time until this program was complete, because in particular, the Hilbert spaces needed for that were the Sobolev spaces that came later, right? Okay. But if you open the book, I mean, this is very much recommended of Kuran and Hilbert, Richard Kuran, that was one of the PhD students of Hilbert. He developed the, I mean, they developed the program together. This has the, these two volumes, Kuran and Hilbert, were, you know, in the 40s or so all the knowledge of applied mathematics could be put into two volumes, these historical books, right? Richard Curran, that was, you know, he gave the name, was the founder of the Institute of Applied Mathematics of New York University, right? And gave the name to it, right? They said Hilbert spaces are essential when you want to succeed on this program. And now my question is, is this a Hilbertian norm? When you integrate with respect to time, the modulus is this a Hilbertian norm? 
Okay, so um, I let you stop a little bit. We stop for say eight minutes. It's now 10.07 here. So I think for you it will be what is 4.07 maybe. We stop eight minutes and we meet again at uh, in eight minutes, 10.15. Please uh, in this time, try to come out with the answer. Is this a space? a Hilbert space in which I can apply the techniques of the calculus of variation, or I am getting trapped into something more complicated. Okay, we start again in eight minutes. Thank you for your attention. Does any of you have uh, an answer to this? Can you please tell me, is this a Hill version norm? Is this norm associated to a scalar product? So when you are in a REN, when you are in say R2, right? and you have vectors. Is this, someone said that this is a Hilbertian norm. Yeah, it's a Hilbertian norm, right? But, but this is not really, you know, given by a scalar product. This is the square root, right? So the, the space that this induces is not a Hilbert space. So you see, you are in R2. R2 is a vector space. I mean, we all know this, right? So it's just the space of vectors, x1, x2. That's a very simple concept, and we represent it on the plane. This is a vector space. But then I ask you, is this a Hilbert space? Well, it doesn't have a meaning. The question doesn't have a meaning if you don't tell me what the norm is. And then in R2, right? Right? You can take the norm right, the Hilbertian norm, power one half, 
or you can take norms like uh, you know, for instance, the sum of the act, the absolute values. This norm here, right? This norm here is Hill version. This norm here is not Hill version. Is this now a Hill version norm? Well, you see that from this perspective, that at every time I take in the norm, you say, oh. If you take the Euclidean norm here, which is the one that endows the space R2 with an Euclidean and Hilversion structure, then you say this is a Hilversion norm. But what I'm doing then on time? In time, I am integrating the norm with respect to T. And when I integrate the norm with respect to T, when I integrate the norm with respect to T, I'm just like adding the absolute value of the different realizations of this norm at the different time instance. So this norm here is not Hill version. So the norm, the norm in here, which is induced by the arc length of the paths joining A and B by the smooth you know, arcs of the smooth arcs joining in A and B, this overall as a norm in the space of functions is not a Hilbertian norm. Actually, you know, in this way, you will define the Sobolev space W11 of functions, right? Depending on time and with values in RD or if you do the closure of this space with respect to weak convergence, you will be in the space of bounded variation. So this is not a Hilbert space. So you see immediately that uh, you, know, you have to regulate, as a scientist, you have to regulate the modeling paradigm you are going to employ because a problem that everyone in the street finds totally obvious, like, okay, you tell me, how do I go, uh, how do I go from my campus to the hotel? And people will tell you, you see the hotel is over there, you know, is this red building in the corner over there, you just go straight. Everyone understands that, it's the straight line. You put it into mathematical way, because you are a mathematician and you like it more rigorous, and then you say, well, you see, I should do it more carefully. Then I define the space of paths, joining A and B, and then I compute the R length, and then I have to minimize this, uh, but I know a lot of functional analysis, so I put this uh, you know, in the, in the context of the Sobolev spaces or the BB spaces, and then you realize that things are getting more and more complicated, in particular because this is not a Hilbert space. And you cannot apply, this is not a, not only is not a Hilbert space, it's not a reflexive Banach space. So therefore, all you know from functional analysis about the calculus of variation that you can find in the book by Evans, Introduction to PDEs, or, or by the, in the book of, uh, of Brazis, it doesn't apply because they say, well, uh, be careful, try to work in reflexive Banach spaces. And these spaces are not reflexive. L1 is not a reflexive Banach space. Why? Because L infinity is not the dual of L1. Sorry, uh, L infinity is the dual of L1, but, but the dual of L infinity is not L1. So the B dual of L1 is not L1. So everything breaks down. So you have to be careful and realize that control theory is not about simply solving very sophisticated mathematical problems, but it's also about, you know, making things to be, you know, reliable, visible, robust, efficient, right? And then there are plenty of, you know, classical applications like irrigation systems. We know humans, we need water, so we could not live on cities if uh, these cities uh, were not uh, irrigated and water could not flow efficiently to get to our homes. The pendulum, the pendulum is not just a, 
you know, a funny oscillatory system, but in the ancient time, it was the key device to measure time. Now, of course, measuring time is not needed anymore. You can just look the watch. I remember the first time I, I was in Sichuan. I mean, in Europe, we used to use, uh, you know, a, a watch in our hands. And when I got to Sichuan, I realized that many of the young people on campus didn't bring a, a watch. They were not using a watch. And then I asked to, at that time now, he's a, a celebrated professor, expert in stochastic control, uh, Professor Chi Liu um, in, um, Chi Lu in, in, in Sichuan University. At that time, he was a, a PhD student. And I asked him, Chi, but why, why students are not uh, wearing a watch? And he told me, why, why do you need a watch? They have a, a cell phone. And the cell phone is telling you the, the hour. It's telling you not only the hour, it's telling you the temperature. It's telling you where you are. It's telling you uh, when is the next bus to the second campus, to the new campus, right? It's telling you where are the supermarkets, where are the restaurants. So it's telling you everything. So you don't need a watch anymore. This is useless. You can use it for decoration, but you don't really need it. But in the, but in the 17th century, Measuring time was not so easy, right? There was not such a watch. There was not an, a cell phone, iPhone or Huawei, doesn't really matter, to tell you in real time what the time is. And so that in, you know, phones are even more intelligent than classical watches. In classical watches, you, you change continent and then you have to regulate the hour, right? Say, oh, it's China. You know, China is uh, six hours ahead, right? So I have to change hour from 11 to 5 p.m. Or, but if I travel to America, then I have to go five back. No, no. With these modern phones, the, the phone will immediately realize where, in which continent you are, and will be adapted immediately. So you can rely, right? You need to take care of, you know, regulating the hour every time you are traveling from one place to another. Your alarm is set at 7 a.m. It will also work you know, when you move elsewhere, it will be 7 a.m. in that new place, okay? But at that time, this was not so easy. So they have to build isochronous penduli that were able to oscillate in a purely periodic manner. Because you see, if you have a, a device that you know is oscillating in a purely periodic manner, and you know that every oscillation is one second, then it's very easy to count time, right? Because we don't have, we have an intuition about the time, but not so clear, right? So I could have a guess of how much I could present in this first three hours lecture, but uh, not exactly, right? Because, you know, uh, time evolves, you know, the way we experience time evolution is quite nonlinear, depends on how do we feel that day, how many questions there are, how many ideas are coming to my mind when I am telling you about all this, then I can get longer or shorter. So if you have a pendulum that is uh, completing an oscillation every one second, then it's very easy to count time because I will simply count how many oscillations, one oscillation, two oscillations, 36 oscillations, then you know what it is. 36 oscillations mean 36 seconds. So, you know, at that time, you know, vibrations of pendula was a critical topic in order to get, you know, people oriented in a space and time. It was not just about dynamical systems or observations of uh, curious uh, periodic uh, dynamics. And you see, as soon as you put, this is the same as happens when, when you are, I mean, if I tell you, that you have a pendulum, which is periodic, and is oscillating with period one, with this, you can count time. One oscillation, one time, one second. So 25 oscillations, 25 seconds. That everyone understands. But now you say, no, no, no. But you know, I know a pendulum should be described by an harmonic oscillator. The harmonic oscillator, of course, in general, in principle, is a, is a nonlinear dynamical system. But let us consider it in the linearized regime, right? 
in which I make it just to simplify the presentation linear. Okay. And then as soon as you put equations on it, you see that there are uh, phenomena that you didn't completely expect that were not so intuitive. These computations were done by Lord Maxwell in back in 1868. You know, it was, you know, during the industrial revolution, this uh, ball regulation mechanism to, you know, to keep the steam engine, you know, constant pressure. So to guarantee, you know, the, the optimal uh, homogeneous uniform performance of the locomotive of the trains, right? He observed that the behavior of that system was not that easy to anticipate. Actually, what he observed is that mechanisms that were very simple were working quite well, while other mechanisms designed very carefully to be working very well, didn't work so well. So in some sense, the performance, what they observe is that the performance of the systems was not going always up. It actually had, you know, critical switching point in which the system was not performing better anymore, but was slowing down. This is of course related to this idea of fluctuations we mentioned before. And this is when, you know, when you look to economies, I mean, you cannot keep the economy going up and up and up and up all the time. There are always crises, right? That could be related to a virus, to an earthquake, you know, to another catastrophe, could be related to international affairs, a crisis, you know, this is like, uh, you know, the chaotic effect, right? That uh, something occurring very far eventually can have an impact also on you, right? That you could not really anticipate. So many systems behave, you know, in this non-monotonic manner. But even though we know that systems do not behave in this monotonic manner, oftentimes we fail to anticipate this time of crisis, right? And this is why, you know, uh, you know, in the, you know, people invest in the stock market and they are, they are so happy because they are earning more and more and more until the day that there is a crack and then there is a, a loss of 40%. And then all the, you know, all the earnings of a few years are lost in just one evening. Of course, you will have been able to anticipate this crack you will have exit the store market the day before, and you will have collected all your savings, all your earnings. But before, but because you were not able to anticipate that critical evening, the day after is too late. Yeah, you go back to this situation where you know you have lost all the increase of your interest rate during, say, a few years, just in one evening. So this is what Lord Maxwell observed. He said, why these mechanical systems that after all are not so sophisticated, why they don't behave in a monotonic manner? And he basically did the following computation. He said, okay, this is the harmonic oscillator. So this is just, you know, uh, is, is simply giving me the oscillations of a spring. X is the amplitude and then the spring is oscillating ping pong, ping pong, ping pong, left and right, left and right, left and right. I know the solutions of this system are very simple, right? It's simply going to be alpha cosine t plus beta sine t. So this will be a purely periodic oscillation. So you see in this spring, there is not dissipation built in. This is an ideal spring in which the amplitude of the oscillations will stay forever, right? This never occurs. There is always fatigue in mechanical system, right? So it's like, you know, regardless of how well you, you are trained, I mean, you can run 10 kilometers per hour. I mean, and you are well uh, trained, you can do it for maybe, uh, maybe 10 or 40 or 100 kilometers, but nobody, there is no human able to run 10 kilometers per hour during an infinite time, right? Life has a finite span. So it will never be this perfect, oscillatory signal preserving 
amplitude, okay? But in this ideal system in which there is not dissipation built in, the oscillations are purely, you know, conservative. The period, the period in time is uh, two pi, is perfect, you know, independent of what the initial data alpha and beta are. The, you know, the periodic behavior is always with the same period two pi, right? And the energy is conserved. How do you see the conservation of energy? Well, that's very simple, right? So the conservation of energy comes out simply from the fact that if I multiply the equation by x prime, what I realize in the first term is that x double prime times x prime is the time derivative of x prime squared with a half. And the term x times x prime is just the time derivative of x squared. So what I see is that the energy, which is just the superposition of the potential energy here and the kinetic energy here, this energy, because of this law, is constant in time, okay? So this is an ideal mechanism that, as I said, is impossible in nature because there is always some dissipation built in in nature, some friction, some fatigue, right? some finite love span, you know, organisms are born and they die, right? In this purely oscillatory mechanism, the energy is conserved. And then Lord Maxwell said, well, but there is normally dissipation built in. How do I model dissipation? Well, this is the simplest way of, uh, you know, modeling dissipation through friction, right? K is a positive parameter can be small or can be large, but it's always positive, right? So K small means little friction. K large means large friction, right? So this is like, you know, in, uh, you know, you are biking and you are doing it on campus on an asphaltic, uh, say, road, then you bike very smoothly and everything is very simple. But if you decide to bike on the beach, you know, with sun, then you realize how hard it is, even it can be even impossible, right? If the sand is too soft, is too dry, you will simply stagnate. You will not be able even to move, right? So this is related to, of course, the, this dissipation coefficient. When K is large, there is a lot of dissipation. So most of your energy is lost, right? On friction with the, with the environment and the motion is very slow or even you know, null. While if the dissipation is low, low, of course you feel that you need to, you know, work harder than expected, but you can still nicely evolve. Then what Lord Maxwell said, let me analyze how this purely harmonic oscillation in which energy, amplitude and period are perfectly conserved, how this, uh, you know, oscillation is perturbed when I take into account, you know, the effect of friction. Of course, nowadays for us, this is a very simple problem, right? We say, well, I mean, this is really uh, the first example in the course, in the bachelor course of ordinary differential equations. This is a linear differential equation with constant coefficients of order two. So, of course, I know that, you know, uh, I mean, here I have written the solution in the form of trigonometric functions. But in fact, I know that to have a better understanding of this, it is even better to write it in this complementary, I mean, uh, you know, completely uh, identical manner as the combination of two complex exponentials, right? And we know that i and minus i are just the roots of the corresponding characteristic polynomial, which in this case, it's going to be simply lambda squared plus one equals zero. And this is what leads to the fact that lambda, lambda squared is minus one, so lambda is plus or minus i. And then, you know, the solution is the combination of these two complex exponentials. And this can be rewritten as a combination of sine and cosine. Okay, a pure, harmonic oscillation. So 
energy is conserved until I put damping on it. This friction term makes me lose energy. Okay, so then in order to uh, really compute how things are ongoing, I have now to solve, right? The new equation, the new characteristic equation associated, you know, uh, to this uh, new uh, second order in time system in which the friction term is included. In that case, the characteristic polynomial is this. And when I compute the roots, I have these roots. So is minus k plus minus the square root of k square minus four times a and c is four divided everything by two, okay? And then of course, when I uh, observe this, I say, well, it's more complicated. Of course, when k is equal to zero, this goes away. This is the square root of minus four. The square root of minus four is plus minus two i and plus minus two i divided by two, this leads to lambda equal plus minus i, right? So I know that, you know, when I am dealing with the purely conservative case, the two roots are plus i and minus i on the complex plane. But now k is positive. When k is positive, what happens? When k is positive, if k is a small, in particular, is smaller than two in amplitude, I see that k squared minus four is negative. And because this is negative, this is an imaginary number. And therefore, the real part of lambda for k is small is minus k over two. Oh, that's good, right? Because this means that, you know, for k is small, right? The two eigenvalues will be over there, right? And I draw them here. You see, I have draw them in, you know, in purpose with a, a smaller vertical component because this is so, right? So the amplitude here for k equals zero was two because the square root of minus four gives me two i. But when k is positive, this is a smaller than minus four. So the square root, the amplitude is going down, right? And then when you keep K increasing, you see that, you know, the real part keeps going to the left and the amplitude on the imaginary component is slowing down. Well, you are still very happy because you see I increase K and then what does it mean that the real part is minus K over two? It means that, you know, I am moving from a purely, I am moving from a, Sorry. I am moving from a purely periodic oscillation into now a pattern in which, you know, there is dissipation built in. And the more I increase the K, and the more I increase the K, right? the more I increase the K, the more the decay will be, okay? But there is a point, a value of K, where something singular happens, right? So as we said, the spectrum that was for K equals zero, located on the imaginary axis with a purely oscillatory behavior, the spectrum has started to shift to the left but also the amplitude on the imaginary vertical component was slowing down, right? So there is a critical value. Where is the critical value you observe in this uh, very simple algebraic formula that you all know? What is the critical value? What is the value of K? in which something happens. Do you see 
here that when k reaches a value, something happens with this square root term. As we said, for k equals zero, minus four, k starts increasing. The amplitude of this number diminishes, but the number is negative. There is a value of, of k where these numbers becomes zero. What is this number? Is k equal two? So when k equal two, the two eigenvalues collapse. This occurs when you know at the abscissa minus one, corresponding to k equal two. The two eigenvalues that were different. You know, they start getting closer and closer and closer when traveling to the left until you reach the value k equal to where they collapse. In this case, you generate a double eigenvalue. Okay, fine. And then you say it doesn't really matter. I keep increasing k. So now you go beyond two and you go to 2.1, 2.5, 3, and so on. What happens then? When k is greater than two in amplitude, this number here is positive. And therefore you have two square roots, plus and minus, okay? And then you have two eigenvalues, lambda minus and lambda plus. And when you check the lambda plus, this is the number you get, you realize that actually this number now you see they are located in the following fashion. One goes to the left, lambda minus, but lambda plus is always to the right of minus one. Actually, you see that when K goes to infinity, so you keep increasing the damping more and more and more and more. And when you increase damping, you see that the real part of lambda plus is going to zero. So the stability of the system is being lost. So the optimal damping rate is achieved when k is equal to one. So it means that if you draw the graph of say k, say friction coefficient versus decay rate, you realize that the graph is doing something like this and is saturated when k is equal to one. So meaning that against our very first intuition, in, it is not true that the stability of the mechanical system is endless increase by increasing the amount of damping you are putting onto the system. And this is why the example of the car driver that in the, in the presence of some, you know, unexpected sudden effect, breaks down the car with an infinite force to stop the motion, you know, instantaneously, this is not the smartest action. Why? Because it is true that you are stabilizing very, very strongly the, the lambda minus eigenvalue but simultaneously, you are destabilizing very much the lambda plus component. And our intuition is simply focused on lambda minus, we are missing the lambda plus, okay? So there is here a saturation effect, right? Which is, again, related to the complexity of control mechanisms in the sense that we can claim through this example that even the simplest mechanical systems that we can control efficiently according to our intuition, the intuition is good enough for a small perturbations, right? You see that when K is positive but little, our intuition is fine. If I put more and more friction, the system is more and more stable. But our intuition works only locally. Our intuition is linear, right? We are working like the inverse function theorem or implicit function theorem. We are working on non-linear local variations of a planar world. But our intuition is not good enough when we go into large uh, deformations. And therefore, we can see out of these examples 
that even in the simplest mechanical systems, even when the systems under consideration are controllable, in this case, they are stabilizable because I was able to move from a purely oscillatory dynamics into an, you know, a stable converging to zero dynamics. Even in those cases where our intuition is right, it's very hard to guess that there might be a saturation effect. And this is what is called in engineering overdumping, right? Right? Why overdumping? Is because you know you have dumped too much, right? After k equal two. Right, so that was, sorry, that was k equal two. I think I wrote here k equal one. It should be k equal two is the spectral abscissa that is minus one because it's uh, minus uh, k over two. So after k equal two, all you do will not benefit the stability of the system because one of the components is destabilized, right? But this is like in real life, right? So. I mean, you go for lunch or you say, oh, the soup is very good. So let me take uh, one bowl. No, I mean, the soup is very good. I take two bowls. Okay, and with two bowls, maybe you are satisfied. You were hungry. The soup was very good. You don't take just one bowl, you take two. Uh, you, you could keep increasing. You could say, no, I take three bowls, four bowls, 10 bowls. But then after a number of them, regardless of how much you are ready to eat, you know, eventually you will start feeling sick, right? And this is what happens with everything. The same happens with, uh, you know, medical products. The same will happen with coffee or tea. I mean, you you drink one coffee in the morning because you feel like to feel like awake. Okay, fine. But if you drink too many coffees, then in the end you are, uh, you know, you you are so agitated that you can do nothing, and maybe you have some tachycardia. Okay. So there is in most processes there is some saturation effects. And, and this is something that, of course, uh, control theory have to cope with because we are not only interested on controlling a system, but controlling a system in an optimal manner. So uh, for today, we stop here. We can start tomorrow with your questions. As I said to Professor uh, Kai, I was called to, to a meeting today at 11 here. It's now 10 minutes to 11 with the president of our university. So I have, I have to quit you now. Tomorrow we meet again at the same time, 8 a.m. in Europe. Uh, I think it's 2 a.m. in 2 p.m. in in, in China. Uh, well, the schedule is, is is public in the in the web of the Jilin University. I thank again uh, Professor Kai Sang and his team for the kind invitation in Changchun and all the audience. And then we start tomorrow. And please uh, have a look to the material. I will send the slides to Professor Kai Sang so that you can have them available, uh, you know, with you and you can revisit the material and then we can start tomorrow with the questions you might want to formulate. Okay. Is that okay, Professor Kaisan? Hey, hello. 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 Uh, hello. Hi, thank you for any I'm the student of Dr. Kai Zhang. Oh, oh Professor oh, Yukao, yeah. Okay. Yes, yeah. so uh, Kai has something to do just a little now. So I will host the uh, lecture. Uh, okay, very good. Thank are you. There, you. Are there anyone has some question about this lecture? We can start tomorrow, you don't mind, with the, with the questions. Okay, oh, okay so okay. let I will send you the, the PDF so you can share it with the participants. And then okay. they have time to revisit the material carefully. And then we can start tomorrow at 8 a.m. Please bring your questions. You can, of course, formulate or write them on the chat or just send them by email so that I can also, if needed, prepare the answers, okay? We can okay. proceed in this multiple way. So tomorrow at 8, we start with a discussion and it's time for, for the listeners to the audience to formulate questions, okay? Okay, so if anyone has okay. something, just send me. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you, okay, Yukao. Okay. So we meet tomorrow again. Thank you. Bye-bye. Ciao. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your attention.